Hello and welcome. This podcast is a production of Lifetime Learning, a division of the Office of Engagement at the University of Virginia. Lifetime Learning brings the knowledge and expertise of UVA's faculty to the university's alumni, parents, and friends. My name is Susan Lynch, and I'm the Associate Director of Lifetime Learning at the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. This podcast features Brooke Lehman, a lecturer at the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy at the University of Virginia. Brooke is a clinical social worker and a lawyer. She's the president of ChildWorks and the current founding partner of Capital Works. Brooke has over 20 years of experience providing direct clinical and advocacy services to children and families, as well as working to improve the systems that administer these services through policy development and legislative advocacy. In this podcast, Brooke and I will discuss mental health issues facing children in 2020. This challenging year of a global pandemic, economic downturn, and societal division. I say that we will be recording this podcast at the beginning of October, given the ever-changing nature of this year. I think that that's important to note. So, Brooke, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. So, Brooke, before we dive into the impact of COVID on children's mental health, can you give us a sense of what's going, what's things that our children or youth are dealing with prior to the pandemic? So what children were grappling with and what services were available? Absolutely. And I think it is very important that we talk about how COVID is currently impacting children in the context of what it was like for them before. So when I talk about the pre-COVID status of children and youth's mental health, I like to categorize that status in two different ways. First are the advancements that have been made including research and science. And secondly, there are the challenges that we still have in part because we're talking about a population that is far from static. Children and youth are in a permanent state of development, as is the environment around them, which leads to some rather unique challenges in this area of mental health. So with that, let me start with the good news. First of all, the body of research regarding children's mental health has grown exponentially over the last decade, which has helped us advance our understanding of the chemical activities and brain's responses to various circumstances and interventions. I know research can seem a bit esoteric to many, but the fact is this knowledge has led us to consider a broader spectrum of mental illness for this population as well as gain a greater understanding of existing childhood disorders. For example, we used to think of ADHD very differently than we do now. Now we know that this particular disorder manifests very differently based on a child's age and sex. These are the types of, of advancements, understandings that we didn't have even just a decade ago. The additional significance of this knowledge has led us to the development of a broader, more diversified group of therapeutic inventions, interventions that we can help address and reduce the severity of an illness based on our ability to recognize a child's symptoms or risk factors earlier in life. So for example, when I was a practitioner, children and youth didn't experience mood disorders like bipolar. I just, it wasn't something we could consider for that population. Now, of course, our understanding of that disorder is much different, which means if we can identify symptoms earlier and hopefully address this challenging disorder much earlier in a youth's life, that child is going to be much better off in the future. I should note that the advancement in interventions also includes the use of psychotropic medications. This particular intervention has not been without its controversy, but it can be a critical component of a therapeutic plan that enables a child to develop important coping mechanisms before maladaptive behaviors set in. So I guess I would summarize all this by saying that we've come a tremendous way in our ability to understand, detect, and treat susceptible suspected and diagnosed mental health illness in children and youth. However, and there was always going to be a however, as I said earlier, there are still many challenges that still exist. 
and that we need to continue to learn more about that are unique to this population. For example, prior to the pandemic, we were seeing a steady increase in the number of children and youth experiencing moderate to severe mental health issues. More and more children at increasingly younger ages were identified as suffering from anxiety and depression that was outside what we might consider normative or, I'm using air quotes, typical. By this, I mean that life is stressful and it causes all of us to experience things like anxiety and sadness and grief. However, it's when these emotions begin to interfere with our ability to carry out common daily functions, so for children that might be school, that we begin to wonder if there's something more significant going on in that child's life. I understand. So thank you so much for that context. Can you explain uh, why are these numbers increasing? Well, I think the answer to that question is multifactorial and ever evolving. Our children, as we all know, are growing up in a very different world than we did, at least the one that I did, and I'm obviously aging myself. Um, but when I think back to all of those awkward teenage years or watch as my children begin to navigate them, I try to understand what it must be like to have those moments captured by a phone camera and then made public. I can't imagine the emotional impact that must have on those youth during such a critical developmental phase. We talk about cyberbullying. And we've even been able to trace individual suicides back to events on social media. That said, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that research regarding this particular correlation is still developing. But I also think as adults who engage in social media platforms, we can appreciate the highs and the lows of exposing ourselves in the ways that we do through these mechanisms. For children and adolescents, social media has opened also a whole new world of competition. Who is the happiest? Who has the most friends by how many, you know, have the most likes or hearts or whatever? It's also increased the opportunity for shame and blame. Again, if we go back to suicidality, taking all these into consideration, the number of youth suicides has been on the rise for years. But equally alarming is that the ages of children who suicide are dropping. And what we know about suicide is that it isn't an action that can be viewed in a vacuum. It's an act that's committed out of sheer desperation and commonly based in underdetected or undertreated mental illness. And then there are, of course, many other factors that contribute to our children's mental health crisis as well. Again, another example, society's definition of performance and success is ever expanding. And this is placing children and youth under increased expectations in school, in sports, and other extracurricular activities. Children are increasingly following more rigorous schedules leaving out the opportunities for just plain old downtime. It's causing them to stay up later, miss meals, and other basic necessities for this age group again as they're moving forward through these developmental phases. So I think it's safe to say that while there has been tremendous advancement made in how we view children and mental health, and a greater knowledge that enables more appropriate ways of intervening and treating these findings, we still have a long way to go. Yes, I see. So with all that said, what has the impact of COVID had on children and in the extension their families? Right, well, again, I think just like the adult populations, the impact has been quite significant. In fact, I like to summarize what we're seeing these days as an epidemic really within the pandemic. You know, we often talk about the resiliency of children and their ability to bounce back from challenges, perhaps even more effectively than adults. However, while this is true, we also need to appreciate that children and youth 
hear, see, feel much more than we might think. So while they may not appreciate the intricacies of a situation, they absolutely note the feelings and behaviors that they witness and then internal all of that, internalize all of that with greater frequency and intensity, again, that we often don't recognize. Yet unlike adults, often not yet developed coping mechanisms and strategies to deal with and express the emotions is what leads children to experience a greater sense of anxiety, depression, etc. So over the last few months, there are endless ways in which we've seen the impact of COVID manifest in children and youth. For example, there are those who may have faced the ultimate impact of this disease if they've lost a loved one. Those circumstances, however, ironically, offer us the most obvious red flags that would tell us that a child or youth is in distress and interventions of some kind are necessary immediately. Fortunately, the vast majority of children have not had to face this level of grief, but that doesn't mean that they aren't experiencing a sense of mourning. Again, like adults, they are grieving for the life that they knew. And I know that these losses can be easy for us to minimize as adults in comparison to what we may be facing. But it's so important that we try to appreciate the magnitude of these losses for them. So for example, a critical component of every human's emotional development comes from their ability to engage in various forms of social interaction. This is all how we develop our sense of self, kind of the who and what we are to become. Well, last spring, children's typical way of engaging with their peers outside of social media, which we talked about earlier, came to a crashing halt. Even now, while we're seeing some easing of various restrictions, life is far from normal. They're still experiencing isolation and a lack of connectedness to the same degree that they were just six months ago. Similarly, other identifiable consequences of COVID on the mental well being of children and youth has been the impact it has had on many of the coping mechanisms that they do rely on to help process and express their emotions. I see this in my own children. My son, who's typically a really easygoing guy and has been very rational about the circumstances that have been COVID, was really struggling a week ago. Of course, there are many reasons that we knew were causing him distress, but one of them is that he's an avid soccer player. And although he's doing distance training, it's nothing in comparison to how a typical season would look for him. In fact, we had this conversation coming home from one of his practices just last week because he was down and feeling overwhelmed by school, et cetera. And he said, I can't go out on the pitch and work this stuff out. And then he went on to tell me that he was finding it harder and harder to find those little nuggets of happiness that he could cling to. So this loss of an extracurricular activity, whatever they may be, are impacting children's mental health significantly. And then on top of this, each family is experiencing their own internal stressors, right? Many parents, for example, have lost their jobs or are facing unemployment or employment insecurity. The obvious consequences of this are greater concerns for affording the basics of life, increased stress and anxiety, perhaps even loss of sleep. More easy, they may become more easily annoyed. They may be less available to their children. All of these things are changing the dynamic in the home. We talked earlier about how children internalize the emotions that surround them. So in a case where the family's income has been compromised, they are going to feel the increased anxiety and stress. They're going to note the change in behaviors all around them, which raise the child's level of anxiety. And I do want to just point out, you know, as we talk about adolescents, they too have probably lost jobs or have employment insecurity. And for them, that's incredibly significant because 
that could be the money that they're saving to go to college with. Or perhaps it's gas money. But being able to get in a car and leave your house and see your friends is obviously a very significant component of any adolescent's life. Yes, I understand. I'm sure that a lot of people are seeing the, a lot of those things. So with all that said, so what are some of the tips that you would share with our listeners, which are UVA's alumni, parents, and friends? So I come to this part of the conversation from both a professional and personal perspective. I'm the mother of three children whose ages range from eight years old to 15, and they are all home all the time. So let me be clear, I am right there with those parents who are listening today, and I'm feeling that same sense of helplessness and fatigue and stress that you are all feeling. That said, my first suggestion would be to make note of any significant changes to your child's typical behavior. I say that knowing that nothing is typical for any of us. But we have been at this for several months, so hopefully you can see some semblance of a new normal, if you will. I would look for changes in eating habits, sleeping patterns, energy levels, emotional responses to just common circumstances, their interaction with peers, and communication patterns at home. But again, I can't emphasize enough that all of this will emphatically be different than it was this time last year. But hopefully, if you're concerned, you can still identify some deviations in their habits. To the extent possible, I would try to create opportunities to talk with your children about any of these changes that you're seeing. Give them the opportunity to express themselves and to put names to the different feelings that they're having. If they're reluctant to speak and open up to you, that's fine. Find someone who you think they will feel comfortable with. Maybe it's a coach, a particular teacher, and then see what you can gain in terms of information that way. The other thing that is required during this time is a reset of our expectations. We've all been forced to do this, and I, for one, can say that this has been challenging for me. But our definitions of success and performance have to change. And then these changes have to be communicated to your children so that they understand it's okay if school, for example, is more challenging and less successful than before. Zoom is exhausting. Going to school, wearing masks for hours on end, following new protocols, all of that is going to have an impact on their stamina their ability to focus, their performance anxiety, etc. At the same time, I recommend setting firmer boundaries. As parents, many of us have let things slide a little bit over the last few months, frankly, out of sheer desperation. <laughs> Perhaps we've allowed more screen time or staying up later, sleeping in a bit longer. But the fact is, kids actually react very positively to boundaries as counterintuitive as that may seem. I've seen even the surliest teenagers ultimately be okay with boundaries, even when every aspect of their behavior would indicate otherwise. Honestly, routine and boundaries can provide a sense of relief for kids. It offers them a sense of security and predictability, and it saves them from feeling like they're responsible for themselves without the strategies and maturities to do so successfully. And finally, I would say that if your child's behavior is significantly atypical, then definitely seek help. I know that there are still plenty of obstacles facing finding that type of help. That includes finding a provider, especially a provider who's specific to children and adolescents. Um, perhaps your insurance gives you problems and you have co-pays. But I will say that one of the weirdest unexpected consequences of COVID is to some degree increased access to care. We finally said that telehealth has a real place in our continuum of care and particularly for mental health services. 
So I recommend starting with your child's pediatrician or guidance counselor, or even get a recommendation from a friend. And then I also will say that there are a lot of resources online. Um, some of the places you might want to visit are the National Association for Mental Illness. They have tremendous resources specifically to COVID and children, as does the American Academy of Pediatrics. So there is information out there. It's readily accessible from credible sources. And of course, I would go back to my recommendation of consulting those that you know and trust already. Well, great. Thank you so much, Brooke, and for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and some practical ideas on how parents can help their kids during this challenging time. Um, this podcast is meant to be in short form, so I'm sure we could go on for another hour on this topic. Even so, there's a lot of information provided here, so parents might want to review this again. And thanks to you for listening for upcoming podcasts and other lifetime learning programming, recordings, and blogs. Please visit our website at alumni.virginia.edu backslash learn. We look forward to you taking part in future lifetime learning programming.